So she's largely at the Imperial College of London in the Center for Classic Electronics. Uh, she also has a part-time appointment in her home country, uh, Switzerland, at the AT Hub. And uh, she's an expert on polymer microstructure with relevance to uh, conjugated polymers. So it's a pleasure to have Natalie here with us today. Yeah, thanks to organizers to have an excuse to come to Colorado to Boulder. It's, I think, the fourth time and I always enjoy it. So now today I will talk about polymers. And actually, just to warn you, I will not use the clicker simply because I'm not capable to. So we have to practice how to raise hands. So who of you thinks he or she knows about polymers? Hands up. OK, that sounds good. Who has heard about flory? OK, not bad. So today we talk about polymers. And Flory was actually one who really started to learn about or teach us about polymers. And one of the key things he describes in the book, everybody working on polymers should at least sometimes look into it, is that these polymers are bonded by covalent bonds. That was not always like that. And therefore, I actually start with a like, little brief history of polymers. Being Swiss, of course, I have to bring the example of uh, Bartholomeus Scovinger. He was actually one of the first ones who made a real polymer. He described it. Actually, he used goat and uh, some low-fat cheese and did some weird stuff with it. And then he got this milk. And actually, he could use that one as a rubber, as a polymer. Indeed, so I, I can claim as a Swiss that the first formulation in history of a thermoplastic polymer was done in Switzerland. Of course, being here now in the US, I have to mention also Goodyear. He was uh, the next one who used something, uh, where is it, a milk juice, to produce something which was rubbery. He stole that essentially actually from the Mexican Indians who already started to do that in the 10th century. So that is what we nowadays actually still use as rubber. Later on, there are still non-synthetic polymers, John W. Hyatt. He worked actually on cellulose camphor, and his big incentive to produce this material was actually billiard balls. He got actually $10,000, or actually $100,000, $10,000 nowadays, $1 million to actually get this nitrocellulose into a plastic material uh, because there was a huge demand on billiard balls. So actually, thanks to polymers, everybody could start to play billiard or actually snooker in the, in the uh, UK. Possibly more for females, very important viscose, though I guess everybody now wears viscose uh, jackets. So that was actually invented by a Frenchman, I, I believe, and he could actually process these materials into fibers. And just for those who don't know what cellulose is, it's this material here. However, we talk now here 1892. The key thing, though, at that time was people actually didn't understand what polymers are. They didn't know that they have polymers. They didn't know that they had long chain, covalently bonded structures. That only started with Staudinger. He was actually a German chemist, but again, Switzerland seems to be the polymer country, at least at that time. He was at ETH, my own institution, when he postulated that polymers, these materials like cellulose, are made up of a high molecular weight, and this is the key, covalently bonded molecules. He had actually massive battles with the scientific community. Like Kay said, it's oft, it, this often happens when you come into a new field with new ideas, the other people will maybe ignore you or actually not fight you. He had a tough life. And he was the guy who turned the, the, the word macromolecule, meaning a molecule which is made up of many different units. Nothing would have happened, though, even despite the knowledge and insight that Staudinger gave, if it hadn't been for the case that, despite now, everybody could play video balls, there was a slight problem, it was made out of nitrocellulose, which means if it came close to fires, and usually these were gentlemen smoking cigars, well, it happened that the billiard ball exploded. <laughs> so that was quite of a bit of a safety issue even at that time. So people still wanted to have actually a replacement for it. 
Also, of course, females started to like their affordable cellulose because it was cheaper than silk and actually had better mechanical properties. I have to admit though, if you see now the, the year where people started to, to, to work with cellulose and wear cellulose, it was not the women who actually helped polymer science. It was World War II because World War II soon started a couple of years later and people ran out of cellulose and not of plastic, plastic fibers, and they needed to make parachutes. So therefore, Dupont invested in finding a synthetic polymer with, with which they could make fibers of, similar like cellulose. So guess, what was the first synthetic polymer? Just shout. Pardon? Nylon. Nylon, indeed. So Carrasco's invented nylon, which we now have in essentially many, many products in cars, clothing, uh, whatever plastic uh, artifact you looked at. He actually really studied Staudinger's hypothesis about macromolecules and especially how you can form macromolecules and uh, made the patent on 966. I have to say, he made a massive mistake. Those who are chemists here, nylon is a polycondensation. Uh, Carothers really believe you need two uh, adapts to make this polymer. And therefore the Germans, who also were in need, of course, of synthetic fibers, could beat him, making nylon 6, which may means they made a polymer out of a ring. So that was massive in patent battles uh, in later years after the war. Another polymer, polyethylene, is actually the biggest polymer nowadays, but commodity polymer, and my laser point really dies. And as also K. Simula said, this one was not designed. Carothers designed nylon. He wanted to prove Staudinger right, and he went to the lab and made the polymer. The guys at ICI, Fassett and Gibson, they found polyethylene, which is the biggest selling polymer on Earth, found it by accident. They actually looked into resins in the high pressure experiment. However, to their credit, they figured out once they opened that pressure, high pressure cell, they did the, the reaction with that they had a white powder in there. Actually, not a powder, it was a white material, and that was polyethylene. So, 1939, the industrial production started, but why did polyethylene survive? Again, war. Polyethylene was actually the best material for rather a cable shielding, and that allowed the Brits, actually, to have a uh, radar in their aircraft, beating the Germans. So, polymers helped a lot. However, the, the sad story is usually war helped them to be developed further industrially. So, Tupperware is another example, and I think I already have to change, no. Uh, that nowadays is used everywhere. I have to say, though, nowadays it's not polyethylene, but polypropylene, a bit of uh, better mechanical properties. And just to end my brief history, Kuhn, who has ever heard about Kuhn, the Kuhn lens? Very good. So he is actually the guy who really understood polymers. Staudinger started it, but Staudinger still thought these molecules are rigid polymers. And that will bring us to semiconducting polymers. Not all semiconducting polymers are rigid. Kuhn really understood it, and we will talk a bit about viscosity in polymer solutions. He also explained rubber elasticity, and that leads really to the godfather of polymer science, the way we started, Flory. Flory knew about kinetics, gels, polymer solutions. I may touch on it, it depends on the time. Uh, as well as liquid crystalline polymers. And as I mentioned, this is the Bible if you ever start to work with polymers seriously. So just to give a little overview, so polymers are not around for that long actually, but nowadays we already have uh, polymer semiconductors. So today and tomorrow we start to look at polymer conformation, molecular weight dependence, we heard a lot over the last week, and the key thing, Processing. Processing will do a lot with polymers that kinetically hindered structures. So we really have to be careful when we compare samples. So let's first talk about polymer conformation. Polymers can be coils, flexible, or rigid rod-like. 
and that has a massive uh, influence how they behave in the melt. So you have this entangled mess, or more like Mikado sticks of stuff lying around. And because of this different conformation, you have to treat these materials differently. You can't take polymer A from Martin Heaney and polymer B from Ian McCulloch and do exactly the same processing, thinking, therefore, you can compare the resulting microstructure. You really have to check with your chemists what type of polymers do we have? Do we have this or do we have this? And the molecular weight will play a role. I will come into that. In mechanics, people know that. So there are four different high strength fibers. So polyester, you can make high strength fibers. Completely different processing route than, for instance, Kevlar. So this is the chemical name for Kevlar which is uh, a rigid rock molecule, which is actually liquid crystalline in solution. There are other polyesters, which are crystal liquid crystalline in the melt. Depending on their chain conformation and their chemistry, depending where they show the liquid crystalline phase, you need different processing rules. And this is something we don't exploit in electronics. We usually simply spin code. And everybody who knows me knows I hate spin coating, so stop that. <laughs> uh, and I will explain why <laughs> later. So uh, let's have first a look at a couple of our new donor acceptor molecules I would regard as rigid. So what can we do? What does it mean? As Lori predicted, these materials, and it's also something I think we don't really look into it, if we go above a critical concentration, they start to order in the liquid state the melt or the solution. That was in the previous slide thermotropic, uh, having some order in the melt, or lyotropic, having some order in the liquid state. The key is usually we try to reduce concentrations. If you have these type of liquid crystalline materials, you have actually to go, you have to increase the concentrations. That was actually the key. Uh, for which DuPont made actually Kevlar fibers. They had a very good technician, Stephanie Pollack, who figured out that she had to go to higher concentrations. So if you go to the lab, not only dilute your systems, try always also the extreme and go to very high concentrated systems. Because what happens when you go to higher concentrations? If you have a lyotropic phase, at low concentration, you have really this stick essentially hindering each other. So, as usual, polymer solutions, viscosity would go up with concentrations. With concentration. <coughs> However, once you hit this ordered phase, viscosity goes down. And that's where actually high strength fibers are spun from. So, it's like the trees in Canada. You know, actually, I actually know, I'm not sure if this is Canada, but let's assume it's Canada. So, <laughs> when, when you put these uh, trees into a lake, you see at high concentrations of these rods these trees, they start to orient. That's a lyotropic phase of trees. The problem though is, and that depends on the molecular weight, you think it would be very easy to orient now these sticks, just press them through a nozzle or whatever. However, uh, one stage by the, the molecules relax and you always end up with a misalignment. So therefore Kevlar is actually not as strong as polyethylene. So that's shown here. You, if you would, for instance, stretch here mechanically, but possibly similar with uh, charge transport, for instance, you always have some misorientation. Me personally, to be honest, I like flexible polymers because we have much, much more tools. Here, the only thing essentially is we can play with viscosity and orientation. Here, we have many, many more uh, little tricks we can play to manipulate the microstructure. And one of the key is entanglements. So it's like cooked spaghetti, and I will have some cooked spaghetti movies uh, coming up. So these molecules, because they're flexible, they form these knots. And one critical parameter here is the molecular weight between these knots. We call that ME, molecular weight between entanglements. And this one depends on chain rigidity, obviously. So the more rigid the chain, the, the, the less knots you will have. That means the longer ME. It also depends, and that's where we as processor can come in, 
on the concentration, the dilution. So this one is the concentration of the polymer in the solvent, so the more dilute, the larger is Me. So we can manipulate how many knots we have in there. Why is this important? The amount of knots will determine the microstructure. It will determine what we call here the lamellar crystal thickness. It determines if you get actually crystals, if you have many, many knots, many, many entanglements, the material stays amorphous, or if you play a trick and get essentially rid of all the entanglements, you get essentially a single crystal of materials. These will form, though, very, very bad films because you have no interconnectivity anymore. The entanglements also tell you why actually polymers are often very easy to process. They, are, they will hinder kinetically the solidification, but they hold the materials together. Contrary to small molecules, Small molecules, it's often very difficult to get homogeneous films. So these entanglements introduce the plasticity, that's why they're called plastics, into a polymer. Unfortunately, and I will repeat that later on, a lot of our semiconducting polymers are not plastic, meaning that they hardly have enough entanglements because simply they're too short. The molecular weight is smaller than Me. Because I have to say, ME only depends on the chemistry, on the chemical nature of the chain, nothing else. Okay, so here is how we can control the microstructure. We can have the melt of a polymer, so this is a high molecular weight polymer. So you see it's quite a mess, many, many entanglements. And if you want to get them crystallized from the melt, either you, you really have to pull it very, very slowly, or what we usually do, you have to go through semi dilute solutions, so you have still a few entanglements. Usually we don't like to go to very dilute solutions, then we really separate both all the chains, the reason being then we, we again, every molecule will make a crystal, but you will get non-continuous films. So this is one of our key tools, the number of entanglements. And I start to believe, actually, based on one talk I've seen from Dean Delachon, I hope I have time, entanglements play a role about visibility, for instance, of PCBM in semiconducting polymers. So, and I showed that already, this amount of entanglement, which is dictated by the molecular weight between entanglement, is really controlled by a solution. And here is an example. So here we have the melt of polymer, complete mess, so when we add solvent, what we do is actually we get rid of those entanglements. And at a certain moment of time, we don't want to over dilute, now I'm really not sure, this is sort of the time where you want to work with. You still have a network, so the red, most of the red chains are connected, so film forming is still good. However, you reduce sufficiently the amount of entanglements so the material can at least to a certain extent, crystallize. If it goes too fast, you see you start to have these uninterconnected uh, molecules, and they will lead to crystals if you're lucky, but it will really prevent film forming. And that happens in particular when you go to very, very dilute solutions. And now, so therefore, with the exactly same material, Person A in London can get a completely different microstructure than, let's say, person B in California, simply depending on the molecular weight of the material and the dilution. We can get amorphous materials. We can get fully chain extended materials when we have essentially no entanglements left or anything in between, depending on the amount of entanglements we have. So let's have a look here because that's how we usually draw our uh, solid state microstructure of a polymer. The problem is it's not so easy. Even when you, when you have entanglements, the, the, the microstructure, the semi-crystalline microstructure, you can get very massively. And this is a slide I stole from Paul Smith at ETH. It's a morphology map of a flexible chain, I may should say so yeah, here, because it's not only the volume fraction, so the dilution, of your polymer in the solvent, but also the molecular mass. 
So what this, does this uh, show you? We not always get this type of arrangement or spherolites. Who has heard about spherolites? Nobody? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Usually spherolites are uh, attributed to the typical polymer microstructure. It's not the case. So let me guide you through this graph. So here we have a melt. So we have no solvent, and then we change the molecular weight. So the beginning, even when we have very short chains, we don't have entanglements even in the melt. The molecules are just too short. It's like macaroni. I don't know how many talents we have here. Yeah? If you make macaroni, it's very, <laughs> it's very easy to eat, yeah? You don't need this fork and this spaghetti and try to whatever. So these are the macaronis of the polymers in the milk. They form, if you're lucky, extended chain crystals. No entanglements. If you don't go then to the spaghettis, you start to have these entanglements. You get what we call folded chain crystals. So this is essentially these type of microstructures. When we now put solvent in there, this transition, we actually we change the amount of entanglements. So actually we get dendrites earlier, then spherolites. Uh, I don't have pictures with me, actually I should have. So these are big, more crystalline structures than here, simply because you get rid of those knots which hinder crystallization. Even if you have, uh, if you have, if you increase the, the amount of solvent a lot, you cross what we call the coil over overlap. You possibly see that quite often. That means really intent. Coil overlap is what I call entanglement. So that's the moment you have the first entanglement. So you take the melt, here you would have entanglements, you add solvent, at a certain moment you only have one entanglement left, and eventually you get these silver crystal solutions. What we often use in high, uh, high strength materials is gels. So these are materials which only have three entanglements per chain. Any guess why three? Why three is so important? Why not six or ten? Or two? One? <laughs> you need three uh, entanglements to get a network. Yeah? If you have, like here, a stick, another stick, this would be an entanglement, both molecules still can move. So despite the knot you make, the molecules are movable. You need really, and now I need a third one, three crossings, so if you move this guy, the other will feel it. Why is that important? Once you have these gels, you can actually produce high strength fibers. And that's actually the next, ah, uh, that's the next slide. That was one question, how do you actually measure this coil overlap, was there was too, small, too, too fast anyway. How would you figure out when you get a polymer, because it's really critical depending on what microstructure you want to get, how would you measure a series of polymers and see where they have their coil overlap? Any guess? Because you want to know where the entanglements start. Exactly, it's viscosity. So that's actually what this graph is all about. So here viscosity, when you don't have entanglements, um, as a function of viscosity, you see there's sort of a linear, uh, I would say, dependence. Usually, uh, the, the, however, the exponent is 1. So in this specific measurement, it was 1.1 to 1.3. Once the entanglements kick in, you get what is called the Einstein relation. So the exponent is 3.8 to 4.1. So actually, we usually say between uh, exponent of 3 over 4 or 4 over 3. So it's very simple measurement. The viscosity is easy to measure. And you know exactly when your entanglement start. Very important. Especially our problem in our field is we possibly often just on this edge, because the molecular weights are not so high. So one day you may be up here, and the next day you are down here, and therefore you get actually different microstructures. 
As I said in high strength polymer fibers, gels are used so they just have one pathway of entanglement to make high strength fibers. And because I'm not good with computers, I have to move it separately. Just for fun. That happens when you have polyethylene ultra high molecular weight. So you heat it below the melting. This two lines would be the melting temperature. So you have a material which has a million or so, actually 10 million of molecular weight. So very, very long chains. And you have only three entanglements per chain, but just sufficient. And actually, I saw at the beginning, these black lines are one millimeter apart. And you can stretch. And you can stretch. So you saw it, it was once that long, now it's already five times longer. Essentially you can go 80 times just by manipulating it. It's the same material as your rubbish bags or you know these little uh, plastic things that hold six bags together. They, you, those you can, can only stretch like five times because they are, those were well processed, many, many entanglements. This was a gel made from a very, very dilute solution. And um, you can stretch continuously. I, I switch possibly to the end if I can. Because he's going on. The key thing is actually what happens. See, we could go till tomorrow. <laughs> actually, you start with something like this and you end up with a fiber like that. The key part here is now he melts it up, actually. So he went above the melting temperature. So you see, actually, it curls up. Why? You had something of a very low entropy. All the molecules were stretched out. Now you go to the melt. In the melt, the material wants to coil up. So that happens now. So it slowly gets to the initial state. And the thing is, now he wants to stretch it again. But now he went to the melt, so we got the increased amount of entanglements per chain massively. Because we didn't dilute, he tries to stretch, and you see it will break immediately. Same material, but once it was a gel, then it was a melt processed material, and I guess now it will break. It should break. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Okay, let's zoom in. Yes, see? So this is when you have loads of entanglements in your material. So something we hardly have looked at, though I think it's possibly key when we talked about uh, when we talk about organic solar cells, because the miscibility of the other material will depend on. So what this process has showed is we get nearly full extended chains. To be honest, because we need some entanglements. We need the, the molecules feel each other. We get, of course, some defects. But this material is the strongest fiber on Earth by density. It actually beats any metal. The only problem is it melts at 140 degrees C. So many applications it cannot be used. And that's different to polyaromids, where you have many, many more defects. So what about organic semiconductors? I'm not sure I have five minutes. I start and then uh, we continue after the break. So as I said, the same actually happens in semiconductors. We have flexible ones and many of the new materials are more rigid. So we really have to adjust our processing. One of the fruit flies I'm still working on. <laughs> Somehow I convinced other people to still work on. Uh, I guess I started 2005. Contrary to what many people believe, is actually polythiophene is a flexible polymer. Actually, that's the reason why I still work on it. We can use all the tricks uh, used in the bulk commodity polymer area. And why do we know it's flexible? We know it from uh, papers like Hefner, already quite old, from light scattering. But also simply simple calculations show that this material can fall very easily simply with six repeat units, very, very similar to polyethylene. And that it can fall immediately means we can have entanglements. This is different when we make a tiny chemical uh, change and when, we, when I talk about the 
I mean, March in the medium, obviously, a big period. So instead of uh, having these thiophene rings that put in a fused uh, thiophene ring, so this is PPTTT, as I call it, I don't go into the chemical name, this one immediately makes the, the chain much more rigid. And what does it do? It induces this liquid crystallinity. So it's a thermal tropic liquid crystal, actually I'm not sure about diatropic, thermal tropic meaning you have some liquid crystalline phases when you melt the material. So it's hot like and if you heat it, you, you get into this liquid crystalline phase. So in the liquid crystalline phase, the material orders, similar like these trees in Canada, and when you cool appropriately, you actually can keep this order. So that's why when you have PBTDT or P3HD, you have to select different processing rules. Simply because one is a rod, the other one is a coil. I will start a bit molecular weight dependence. I will still talk a lot. This is just the start. And uh, it gets much more tricky when, when, you have, when you have different chains. K similar addressed it. Why? Depending on the molecular lens, they behave differently. They are either non entangled, as I mentioned, like the macaroni, or you really have like this bunch of cooked spaghetti, complete mess with many entanglements. And as mentioned, this depends on chain rigidity, but the key contribution here is molecular length. The longer the chains, the more entanglements you have. Why is this important? These materials that are not entangled, when you process from the melt, form what we call these chain extended crystals I already showed before. Once you have one entanglement, so these chains are still free to move, you get a bit of an esoteric structure, a folded chain crystal. So one molecule going through one crystal, but not interconnected. Actually, what these three materials have in common is that the next crystal is fully non, well, it's not connected at all, I should say, with the next crystal. So these materials are brittle, these materials are a pain to get good films from. Once you get them those entanglements, though, you get these semi-crystalline morphologies, where then on the supramolecular level you can get the dendrimers, the spherulites, whatsoever. On the molecular level, key is, though, what they all have in common, you have crystalline moieties and you have amorphous moieties, and these crystals here are interconnected. So if you follow the red line, blue line, red line, blue line. These crystals, uh, one molecule goes through many, many crystals. Joe Klein, for instance, proposes, therefore, these materials are often good for charge transport because once you get a charge in, even when it has to go through the low mobility, amorphous phase, it will be able to reach the next crystal where the mobility is high again. This is different in this case here. Because similar like in inorganics, you start to have your brain boundaries where you will have traps, where charges will be trapped. In the polymer world, only those, as mentioned, are called plastics. Those we can plastically deform. So, because when we stretch these materials, similar like in the movie, now my laser point really died on me, uh, you stretch out actually this amorphous phase. So the less entanglements you have in this amorphous phase, the more you can stretch this material. These, though, they are very brittle. They immediately will fail on this interface. I have to say, though, the problem I think, especially in the OPD area, less possibly in the transistor area, is we usually work with materials which have a molecular weight which are in this regime. So even when your chemist says, I have a molecular weight of 60,000, the monomer unit is so large that you maybe have an oligomer of 8, 9, 10 units. And therefore you see why the properties change so much from batch to batch. The reason being, once you're in this regime, especially down here, end groups, which I haven't uh, illustrated here, 
will determine often the electronic properties. So if you end up here or here, here possibly you still have a bit of your polygated material, but eventually down here, N groups will most likely be the killing bit. The microstructure will change. So in this regime here, uh, you end up with polymorphs. So even when chemists say, well, I have now a high molecular weight, it's 60,000. Unfortunately, very often, it's just not good enough. If you want to have reproducibility, and I guess that's why plastics, commodity plastics are so loved, uh, here, the material is much, much more forgiving with little changes in molecular weight because these, li these uh, lamellar crystal thickness eventually saturate. It will always stay the same. You have maybe a bit more crystalline material or a bit less. However, you can much, much more easy reproduce the microstructure on this side. So, this is nothing new. Maybe that's one of the last slides for this part. It's very, very known in paraffins. I mean, the best example of paraffins is polyethylene. So we don't have to reinvent everything. It has been uh, described in the 60s, and the onset of chain folding, that's exactly this transition from chain extended to this microstructure is very well known in all the commodity polymers. And just to show a beautiful electromicrograph of a chain extended crystal of polyethylene, but you see also here what polydispersity does. When you're in this regime, all of the different chain lengths will crystallize with their partners of the same length. So here you have a crystal, one molecule stretches from one side to the other. Here you have the smaller polyethylenes uh, crystallizing. So you, you have phase separation depending on the chain length. This is different than when you when you increase the length, so here in Port Polyethylene, actually, Mark the Breckenkamp really did some beautiful TM. Here you see exactly the same chain extended crystals. So the lit these little lamellas are chain extended crystals of P3HT, so the P3HT chains are perpendicular to the lamella. Once you go to higher molecular weights, you get the semi crystalline microstructure of amorphous phase, so the amorphous phase is less dense, so in the electron micro. My micro, uh, microscope uh, brighter and the crystalline units, and it gets more and more messy the higher the molecular weight. So we really have to always keep in mind where are we, and that's why these viscosity measurements are very important. And when we work in solutions, as we usually do, obviously this transition even goes further down. So as soon as we, when we have a material like that and dilute it, the chance is quite high that actually we also get to chain extended crystals. And in many cases, I'm not sure if we really want that. A, we lose interconnectivity. However, also as we heard from Kuhn, we sometimes need actually interfaces. And I will talk about interfaces between amorphous and crystalline phases later on. So I think with that, I stop for this part. Are there questions regarding molecular weight, chain confirmation? Yes? On your graph, which uh, was showing the viscosity and how you determined where you were, I couldn't read the bottom axis. What, what was that? That was the viscosity. Uh, no, that was the concentration. concentration. Uh, but you get exactly the same graph with molecular weight, essentially. So, because the molecular weight determines the critical coil overlap or the concentration for a given polymer. But the behavior will be exactly the same. I just have the same sort of a question that we were just talking about. I mean, this is a melt to a solid, not from solvent to solid. Uh, this will be exactly the same when you have a solution. Yeah. The only difference will be you will change here the amount of entanglement. So if you add here solvent, now at the moment you have three entanglements per chain. If you add solvent, you end up with maybe one. So you will end up with this material, which usually from the melt would have this microstructure to either make this one or this one. So the molecular weight will change? Um, the molecular weight will stay the same. Actually, ME, this molecular weight between entanglement will change. Which, yeah, so with, when you add solvent, you reduce the amount of entanglements. Uh, how can we measure ME? ME, I will show that. One is, um, well, 
Actually, it's a good question. We do it usually indirectly, so it, it's really the viscosity. So when we know we have one entanglement or three, I show some examples also on mechanical tests. Uh, where we start to have plastic deformation, we know we have these three entanglements, so we have a network. We know usually sort of the molecular weight, so the total one, and simply divide it by three. So it's not fully accurate, but it's a good estimate because usually we have anyway a bit of polydispersion, so meaning we have different chains of different lengths. But I show an example. Uh, I had a given concentration. Particular concentration, any remain constant for all entanglements, all distance? Um, no, uh, for when you, when you have different, a series of different molecular weights. For any one, like in the last picture. Ah, here? Uh, any is constant for all entanglements? Same? Uh, ME is actually always constant for a given polymer. Okay. You change it then indeed when you change the, I mean, if you have a material, ME is given, but you can change it then with dilution. So when you add uh, solvent, you will change ME. You could change ME chemically by putting this more rigid blocks in, like few strings. That's okay. Um, what would, for which method would you recommend for measuring the viscosity? What we do is what is called, and I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> the Uberlode. So it's like, uh, we used that also, I worked for an island company for a while. Uh, it's like a glass tube. It's very simple. You have a line, and essentially you put your solution in, it makes something like that, and you simply measure the time it takes your solution to get uh, through this little tube. So it's a stopwatch experiment. It's not ultra accurate, but uh, it helps. We did it for PSHD with different molecular weights, and we got uh, data where the entanglement set in very simple like mechanical tests. I think it's called Uberlode. I look up the spelling. But that's really the easiest, because all the geometry or whatever, working in solutions as we do, is painful. And you need much more material, actually. Another one for me. To what extent is entanglement determined during the synthesis? Good question, actually. Uh, Gore-Tex, so it's Teflon, is synthesized in such a way that there is zero entanglement. So therefore, actually, you can, Teflon is usually very high in metal weight, Gore-Tex is too, but because it's synthesized such that you don't have entanglements, you can actually simply squeeze it through a wall, so you can process it in the solid state. So the synthesis determines it a lot. The, the thing is obviously the more your polymer is dissolved uh, when it's synthesized, the more entanglement you get. So Teflon is very, very hydrophobic, so that's why it's very difficult to find a solvent. That's why actually it, it's synthesized in sort of a non solvent environment. So it never sees a liquid state, and therefore it doesn't quite up anything. Now let's thank Go for my brother. Uh, is there a difference in preference for the uh, molecular alignment between, let's say, OPD and a transistor? Well, I would say there's evidence would suggest there is. There's other evidence that suggests there isn't. <laughs> in, in, intuitively, simply what I've seen uh, published, I would say it doesn't matter so much. Despite pa pa there, are, there are papers around that would suggest an allied preferred orientation helps. I think other issues, really like miscibility or so, are much, much more critical. But I show some examples. So, but that's my personal opinion. I think it doesn't matter so much. Thank you. Well, let's thank Natalie for the first talk.